So, but but you went into producing too, right? Yeah. What happened is my college roommate, who was in the food business, somehow ended up the CFO of Full Moon Productions, which is a Charlie Band legendary legendary uh, B, B movie. You know, the top. I mean, you got Roger Corman, but in in the eighties, Charlie Band was mammoth. You know, and all of his films involve puppets. You know. Lot, you know, the, and the puppets move. Yeah, Puppet know. Master yeah, and all that. Master, yeah. all that stuff. So, um, but they were non-union movies. So, which Total Recall was too. That's why, because we shot it totally out of the country. Holy cow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, but that that can't happen anymore. They changed that rule. But uh, so, so was it the Vault Killjoy? Uh, Ragdoll was the first. Oh, Ragdoll. One. Okay. Ragdoll was the first one. That, but how I got it is that I acted in one because Charlie Band bought a studio, Castle Castle Films. That was he was the first. He was a real forward thinker. He so he he bought it outright. It was he all... bought this theater or this studio in Romania, <laughs> and decided you know before everybody was you know Cold Mountain was shot at that studio after he lost it, but we went to Romania and shot this film called Hideous. And I was acting in it. And I was playing uh, Mr. Lazar, who had a thing for biological oddities. So he had all of these oh, hideous <laughs> puppets that I was, I had my, the arch foe, and we were like fighting over, it was the most ridiculous film in the world. <laughs> But it was the only time that I could do one of these films. And uh, while I was over there, Charlie, this is the first one that Charlie had directed in Romania. Oh, wow. And he's like Big Daddy buying caviar and all this stuff. And it's Romania in February. We were freezing our asses off. I hit him with my first and best pitch. I said, all black horror movies. And he went, hmm. And two years later, I ended up back in L.A. I had moved back to New York to do uh, Ragdoll. What are the other ones? The, uh, the, the Vault. Uh, the Vault uh, and Killjoy. Yeah. Yes. And I know Killjoy. That's cool. Yeah, they were like, I'm going, geez. But it was great fun because if you're spending, you know, you know $100,000 or $100 million, you still got to go through the same steps if you're making a movie. And Charlie Band was very a stickler about making the movies right. But you you had done a couple indie films early on, right? Yeah. So did. did that kind of prep you for what a Charlie Band film, or was that totally Nothing different? Prepared you for <laughs> a Charlie Band film. I mean, he's a piece of work. <laughs> Character. Uh, it was a very big learning lesson. But he was a filmophile. He really. He was one of the first to use digital, uh, but he didn't use it until, you know, they had this thing called film look at that time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. He wouldn't use it until it really looked good. So, you know, so he was on the cutting edge of that. And he just, you know, couldn't hold it all together. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they had a good run for a long, yeah, for a long time. time and uh so it was a lot of fun it was you know a lot of fun working for him because at the time i was working for him i had a corner office in hollywood and vine i mean all this flash going on that he was doing and we shot those films in and around uh la and they were a lot of fun and so that was that it wasn't like was that like were there any crazy sets that was just like you know cocaine and people running around or was it always sort of you know business um most of them were business i mean especially because he didn't really have the money to be throwing it <laughs> I mean, yeah, he yeah. really didn't it, you know we weren't paying nobody nothing i mean he got permits but that's about it that's about it, yeah. so and they were probably the 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 shoots were probably very short oh, shoots were sh week you know yeah. week eight days i was going oh my they said, listen, we're giving you, you know, eight days to do Ragdoll. That's a lot. 
you know, by the time we got around to Killjoy, they were trying to do it in half a week. I'm going, come on, people. That's a bit much. You know, so, uh, but if any of that foolishness or antics would have happened, it would have, had on, it would have happened on Total Recall because it was huge budget. But it didn't because Arnold wasn't doing that stuff. And, but he did have the folks come, you know, Grace Jones came down. Oh, cool. And, and all that stuff. And What was she like? Was she cool? She was, everybody was chill, you know. Uh, it was, Arnold had two gyms. He, you know, brought two gyms. They delivered his motorcycle upside down. When they delivered it down, he didn't even get upset. He just said, <laughs> he went, fix it, you know. And he, he had two gymnasiums so that he, people could share. And Arnold's such a pip, you know. <laughs> he goes, oh. I go up to Arnold, I said, Arnold, do you mind if I use one of your gyms and he goes he looks at me he goes please really and i laugh because he's really sharp i mean he doesn't miss a beat yeah and uh but we had a really really good time i mean he and he's a good guy uh in the sense that when i got back and he was doing t2 he was shooting it in, uh, in the valley in Los Angeles, that motorcycle scene where he lands and he goes into the bikers to get you know the clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was a big brother in the Big Brother program, and my little kid lived over there. Uh, we were actually where Rodney King got beat. Oh, was that area? Shot that oh, wow. So I had given Gavin, who was ten at the time, some of the shots that I had taken. You know, of us playing around and. He took one of the pictures over to the gate and said, my, my big brother was in Total Recall and here's the picture. The guy took the picture in, Arnold brought my little brother in and signed the pictures and gave him a headshot and told him to say thanks. I mean, Arnold's a good guy. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So now you have, so you, you do, you have a, what, you have a couple things going on right now. Yeah. Um, one of the major things that I'm doing right now is I have a one-man show called Frederick Douglass in the Shadow of Slavery uh, that a good friend of mine, Tom Dugan, has written. He's really uh, become a master of these one-man shows. In fact, he's got one that he's acting in that's opening in New York off-Broadway in the fall called Simon Wiesenthal, The Nazi Hunter. And that's oh, wow. great, but and so he wrote this one for me, and I've been taking it around the country for a couple of years now, and it's sort of like my Mark Twain tonight. I'll just take it out and just do it. Oh, that's so it, cool. You know, when I'm like, uh, I didn't do it at all last year because I was doing um, Jekyll and Hyde, but uh, it's it's that's one of the great things, and I'm getting ready to shoot a little film. Uh, called Stuck, and it was a little musical that won a fest. The New York Musical Theater Festival won it. He it, it won the show, the festival a couple of years ago, and there went straight from that little thing to making a movie. And I'm playing a small. You know, they always if you get in the stage thing, they always are trying to get somebody else to do it. But I'm. They wrote a little role in it, especially for me to do. So well, cool. I shoot that next week, and then I go off to St. Louis to do a play that was on Broadway a couple of years ago called One Man Two Governors, an English farce. Nice. And uh, I'll be there until October. And that's the actor's life. You're always bouncing around. Wow. Right? Yeah. You just you've been cranking stuff out, huh? Cranking stuff out, and is look. it is it at this point like I know you know I I know a lot of actors and. And uh, Broadway performers, and you know, the struggle to get roles is just so difficult. And uh, has it? I assume it's gotten a little easier as you've gotten credits under your belt. Is that totally wrong? Or it's you know, it's like that Janet Jackson song. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> right, right, you know, right. Uh, yes. The the thing that's better now is that. All of your friends who you all struggled, you know, coming up are now in positions to help out if they've decided to go direct. Like, 
the director of Jekyll and Hyde, is one of my absolute closest friends. And so I said, Jeff, uh, I need to do another Broadway show. And so I still had to audition, but, you know, sometimes you can't even get a new, you know, he sort of created a special niche for me to be in that show. Oh, that's so that cool. That wasn't there. So that, in that sense, that happens. My agent and I went to school together, you know, he now has his own agency. So, you know, so that's sort of easier, but I still have to audition for this thing that I'm doing in St. Louis. Right. I went regular audition. Yeah. You know, uh, still have to be great. Doesn't matter. That's, right, if that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, when you're a journeyman actor like I am, who make, you know, I make my living at it and I always have, uh, sometimes it's great. Some, some people will offer you things. I did a, a TV series when I was out in L.A. for David Lynch, and uh, it was called On the Air, and it was the weirdest. <laughs> shit. You know, everybody thinks David Lynch is weird. He is weird. His mind is. <laughs> and he always talks like that, too, like, hi, I'm David yes, Lynch. And he's, you know, <laughs> uh, it comes out in his work, because he seems like a, you know, he's a regular guy, except for the khakis and the black turtlenecks. I mean, you know, yep, but... Yep. Uh, and again, that was, I didn't even have to read for that, but it was a, my agent called and said, David Lynch is doing a new series. I went, wow. You know, cause I love Twin Peaks. And so I went and I met with him and we sat and we talked and he asked me, so what's going on in your life? And at the time, I was the artistic director of an arts organization called the Imagination Workshop in L.A., which a group of actors, writers, and directors that work within the psychiatric community, kids at uh, risk, veterans, the homeless. It was a great organization. We had some great people, Life Banner, all these people working there. And he goes, the log lady's husband is in that organization. And I'm like, oh, that's right. Well, I, I did hear that. He goes, I love that organization. He goes, can you cry on cue? And I went, sure. I never <laughs> cried on cue in my life. And he said, sure. And we chatted for a little bit. I didn't read anything. I'm in my car going home. I stopped off, called my agent. My agent said, you got it. I went, what? And he was at the height. I mean, getting something like that in Los Angeles is so hard. You got to go to the network. It was ABC and... You know, usually the directors have to send three or four choices. Oh, yeah, Network yeah. Chooses. He just sent his cast. He said, this is, this is who I want. Oh, I went, man. Wow. Yeah, there's very few people with that power. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, the show was too ahead of its time. Talking dogs. <laughs> the, the director, I was playing the sound man. It was about a live television show in the 50s. And I was playing the assistant sound guy. They didn't have no black people working as crews in, in the 50s, but he had this guy there. And the director of the show, of the Make Believe show, spoke a language that David Lynch made up so nobody could understand him. And I mean, he was talking all the time, and his assistant was translating it. And I was going, oh, I don't know if this is going to work. No, we <laughs> shot, you know, we shot seven and out, you know, but it was great because. It was the first, one of the first half hour comedies without a laugh track, and it was single camera film. Okay, so it nice. Like, it was a, like a little movie each week, and it was, it was, and they brought in great directors to do them, because everybody wanted to work with David Lynch. Can you find those? So are those? If... You can get, I think the first three are out there floating around in the ether. Yes. That's cool. I got to see that. It's I didn't know. on the air. It's weird. It is weird. So you work with some pretty uh, amazing directors. Yeah, I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate. You know, theater-wise, you know, Bob Fosse, wow. Liza Minnelli, Cheetah Rivera, Jason Alexander when he was acting on stage, and we did the rink together. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Was he a nice guy? Oh, absolutely. I, in fact, directed his one-man show in L.A. He did a show called Didn't Hell Harry about Harry Truman. And he asked me to direct that. And uh, so we, we, uh, we remain friends. His son's bris was the first one I ever went to. Oh, wow. I almost passed out. <laughs> <laughs> I literally did. I said, you gotta be, I started sweating. I said, you got to be kidding me. 
you know, that was funny, you know, so, uh, so it's wonderful in this, when you have this career and you've been a, you know, around a long time, you run into these people. The, cause you, it's so intense. You become family very quickly. And mm -hmm. even if you go off and don't see when you see each other again, that same tie is there because it's like, you've been through the wars, you know, uh, and especially if you're doing stage, you're doing it eight performances a, a week. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, beat you up. It beats you up, but it creates a bond. And especially if the show is good and a lot of fun. And if you, you know, if your show makes it to Broadway, that means it has to be halfway decent. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, especially now. I mean, uh, that's yeah. just so, uh, yeah. so competitive with oh, all the, these big uh, remakes and all that. Yeah. And it's the dynamic has changed so much because they don't want to take as many chances on original material anymore. So mm -hmm. they're doing these remakes. They're, they're taking movies. Da, 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 you know, they're doing limited runs, trying to bring in the names. And yep. da, so yeah. it's a whole different ball game. But you've got to adjust. And uh, it's great when it happens. And as I tell... Uh, young actors for the most part if you've worked before you'll work again because it's getting it's so hard to get that first job and if you do a good job eventually you work again now what you have to do in between is what is the rough part right you know, how you sustain yourself it's uh, so you try to do different things that are all I try to do different things that were always involved in the business in some way or Right, yeah. Directing, producing. That's smart, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and try to be fulfilling that way. And that artist, you know, that artistic job in um, the artistic director job in LA was great. I did it for a long time. And a lot of actors went through it. And, you know, we could always, it was set up so that if you got a job, you just went and someone filled in for you. So, in fact, I, when I was just starting out, I used to work at the half price ticket booth in Times Square. They were all, they were, everybody that worked in it, not selling the tickets, that was the union, but before they had the electronic board, yeah. we had to go out and put it up and go to the theaters and pick up the tickets and bring it in, you know. And it was a great survival job, you know. So uh, I was doing children's theater at the time. And you got to know the box office people and they let you sneak in and see the shows. So That's cool. That was yeah. And you, you grew up right in, uh, in Queens, or, or Queen, Long Island City? Right, Long Island City. And Performing Arts was on 46th Street. So I grew up at Queens Plaza. I was at school just like that. I yeah, mean, Literally. Wow. If I got on the subway at 8.05, I was in my seat at school at 8.20. Did you ever think the uh, real estate would uh, turn around? <laughs> the New York Magazine did an article years ago. I, you know, years, many, many years ago. I was still living in the projects, I think that saying Long Island City was going to be the next big thing. Cover story in New York Magazine. Yeah. I went, you have got to be joking. <laughs> there was nothing but the projects and the factories. Yeah, yeah. And Queensbridge was completely insular. We had our grocery store. We had the 5 and 10. We had the community center where I learned how to tap dance. We didn't have to go out at all except to go to school. We had a movie, you know, an old sticky floor movie in there, you know. And, <laughs> yeah. But around it was nothing. Yeah. So I knew, you know, Long Island City is one stop from Midtown. Oh, or yeah. Whatever direction you go. Yeah. And it has the views of Manhattan that, so when they tore down the Pepsi Cola factory mm -hmm. and left the sign, and that, where those buildings are right now, that was going to be the Olympic Village. That's why they decided to build there, because I had a friend of mine who was, you know, on that oh, wow. committee. And so they built those buildings, and and then we didn't get the Olympics, but then they had the, you know, and so the City Corp built their headquarters there. And everybody, you know, Manhattan, there's just nothing left in Manhattan. And they really, you know, Brooklyn is fine, but Long Island City is right there. And of it's course, the right artists... There took over the lofts, you know, yeah. took over the factories first yep. and made them lofts. And that's where we went and we met at one of those galleries. But 
it's off the charts now and it's beautiful i mean you know and now they're building the infrastructure the yeah grocery stores we stuff. were just over there um a couple of days ago and uh yeah right near the park or whatever it's incredible i never i i had never been on that side of those i saw those big buildings going up i'm like okay well where's everyone hanging out you know and then you go on the other side near the water and you're like oh oh yeah yeah it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing over there well, uh, Mel, if, if, if people want to uh, uh, learn more about do you have a website? Or I do, MelJohnsonJr.com. I need to update it for any of you guys who have got no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it talks about the Frederick Douglass piece and gives a little bio, and uh, I like it. It looks good. You know, um, I try to put things on it that I, you know, that I'm, I'm woefully not <laughs> this technical person, but yeah. Uh, but but still, like it. Well, they could always look up on the. Uh, it's an international Broadway database they too, have right? Two now, yes. Yeah. The international movie database and the international Broadway database. Yeah, that one's and pretty I, cool. You know, th- that fascinates me. I have never posted anything on any of those things, <laughs> and they are up to date. Oh yeah. As to what you are doing. I think you have a wiki page too. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, you know, someone said, you need to Google yourself once. And I went, I said, are you kidding?